What does it mean to be a Western yogi? How can someone who was born and raised in the West, who comes from a Judeo-Christian background, practice yoga and meditation in an authentic and genuine way? My name is Christopher Sartain, and this is the Western Yoga Podcast. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Western Yoga Podcast. It's a beautiful, sunny summer day here in uh, the southern Andes Mountains in Chile. And we're busily preparing for our uh, summer season here. And we've got a yoga teacher training coming up in about a week. We'll have about 10 students here staying with us for a couple weeks. And then another one in February. And then a couple of uh, retreats scheduled for March. We've had some volunteers here working and helping us uh, prepare everything at our uh, retreat center here. In this episode, I'll discuss the five koshas of Vedic uh, philosophy or yoga philosophy and how our understanding of this cosmology of the five koshas uh, can assist us in our spiritual journey and our spiritual enlightenment process. I wrote a book about the five koshas Oh, back in 2011, uh, called The Sacred Science of Yoga and the Five Koshas. It uh, also exists in Spanish. There's a Spanish version called Los Cinco Koshas. And uh, that book is available on Amazon or Kindle, as are all of my books. If you're interested in my books, um, an easy way to find them is to go to my webpage, which is koshasbook.com, K-O-S-H-A-S-B-O-O-K.com, koshasbook.com. And there you'll find links to uh, all of my books. And they're, they're all, by the way, available on, on Amazon and uh, Kindle. And so I, I encourage you all to uh, help a brother out, <laughs> buy a book. Um, that, that book, uh, The Sacred Science of Yoga and the Five Koshas, has now sold over 10,000 uh, copies in more than 14 different countries. So it's a fair, fairly popular book, by far my, my most popular book, <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, I'm not sure. It's it's uh, it was my, one of my first attempts at, at writing. Well, at writing anything anything lengthy like that, and uh, so hopefully I've I've improved quite a bit as a, as a writer and author since since then. It's been about twelve thirteen years ago, something like that. But. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, my guru, uh, Roy Eugene Davis, uh, was an integral uh, part of the, the writing process. I sent him some rough drafts, and he actually helped quite a bit with the uh, editing process, even, you know, grammar stuff, and he, he, he was a perfectionist, for those of you that, that knew him, you are well, well aware of that, uh, but uh, so at any rate, I mean, he sent, he mailed the book back to me, I sent him a physical copy, and he mailed it back just full of comments, and uh, <laughs> some of which were uh, fairly disheartening, I'll have to say. There were some things, uh, some areas of disagreement, shall we say, and uh that's okay. It's okay to disagree about certain things. He once told me in a private conversation, um, when we we came upon some some area of disagreement, 
He said, if you agree with 90% of what I teach, that's great. If you agree with 100% of what I teach, you probably need to see a shrink. Meaning, this isn't a cult. So you don't have to agree. We don't have to agree on, on everything. And as a matter of fact, if you agree with every single thing I, I say and do, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe you need to work on your own vivica or, or discernment. And so it's, it's, it's okay to disagree about some things. You don't have to agree on everything. And as a matter of fact, well, gosh, nowadays, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting trend that, that I've been observing, oh, over the last 10 years or so, I'd say, as people become more and more polarized, especially politically and all that, it's become more difficult to maintain friendships and, and relationships. It's, it, it seems as though people have to, to agree on almost 100% of everything in order to maintain their, their friendships and relationships and working relationships and all that. and People tend to fight and bicker over trivial, trivial matters and, um, and disagreement just isn't isn't tolerated by certain groups and certain organizations and all that. That's too bad. It's good to uh, keep an open mind and be open-minded and not be uh, small-minded or closed-minded. And if you do have areas of, of disagreement with folks, that's okay. That's okay. It's okay to disagree about about certain things and People get addicted to being right. I, I know a lot of folks like this. They, they have to be right. It's just like, uh, it's, a, it's an addiction. And of course, this has to do with the ego. And, and even folks uh, that, you know, have, haven't looked into certain subjects or topics. And um, they think, they think they're, they're right, even though they haven't done much research or investigation in, into things and just more and more a lot of folks with a real kind of smug know-it-all kind of attitude about a lot of different subjects and topics and uh, of course this is just the ego and just arrogance and, and all that I'm thinking we we know things uh, even if we if we don't <laughs> and so we've in our modern culture, it's, it's become uh, more and more apparent that uh, we have a, a new addiction uh, epidemic, and that is the addiction to being right, ha having to be right, having to win arguments. Um, I, I try not to get involved in, in, in that as much as possible and try to stay out of uh, especially political discussions and things of that nature. And uh, I, I certainly have, have gone through that, that phase uh, where, where I, I needed to be right and I needed to prove my point to everybody and uh, needed to comment on, on things constantly that um, to, to try and prove a point or to try and win an argument or things like that. Now I know better and uh, not everything requires your commentary. You know, hu humility is really the realization that not everything requires your input, especially if it's unwarranted or um, unwanted. And if, if folks don't, don't ask for your input, but you give it anyway, well, that's pretty clear indication you're kind of arrogant and you got some some stuff to work out there so the five koshas is a cosmology that comes to us from the Taittiriya Upanishad originally which is uh, one of the oldest Upanishads for those of you that aren't familiar the Upanishads was a group of texts that were written 
after the Vedas, uh, the Vedas, oh, they, they come from about 3,000 years uh, B.C., approx. People will argue about that, but, but we, we know that the Rig Veda, at the very least, is, come, comes from about 3,000 B.C. It's the oldest Veda. And then the other three Vedas followed, but at any rate, the Upanishads were essentially philosophical uh, f f philosophical commentaries about, uh, about the Vedas. And so, in other words, the Vedas do contain some uh, philosophy. There's a lot of stories and myths and oh, ceremonies and um, a lot of information about uh, you know how, how to perform ceremonies correctly and a lot of history and myths and stories and all these things. Kind of like the Bible. It's very complicated and so the, the study of the Vedas is, is also quite complicated. But at any rate, uh, there is some philosophy in, in there. I don't know that I would call it yoga philosophy, a Vedic philosophy. Probably be uh, more correct. However, in the Upanishads, we do find for the first time in, in history, uh, yoga philosophy. And so really, yoga philosophy starts with the Upanishads. The Rig Veda, for example, mentions the word yoga, um, but not with the same meaning that we have uh, nowadays as it concerns the, the meaning of, of the word yoga. In the Rig Veda, yoga simply means union or to unite, you know, one thing with another, usually a, a horse with its uh, chariot or cart or what have you. And so it had a, a more mundane meaning. And um, in the Upanishads, <clears throat> we find definitions for the word yoga that we, we use uh, to this day. And so, really, the, the, the philosophy of yoga starts historically uh, with these, these texts, with this group of texts. There were many Upanishads written, although... Uh, there are said to be 108, you know, principal Upanishads. And those are broken down into groupings and whatnot. And, of course, there's a group of Upanishads called the Yoga Upanishads, and those are the most important Upanishads to read uh, as it concerns yoga philosophy. But, at any rate, the Taittiriya Upanishad was one of the oldest Upanishads coming to us from 1000 B.C., so this was one of the first Upanishads ever written. The authors of the Upanishads, uh, we, we don't know exactly who, who wrote them. They're just referred to as the Rishis. Rishi just means visionary or seer, essentially. And so, the belief amongst uh, yogis and Vedics is that the Upanishads were essentially channeled directly from God, uh, the Vedas also, and so these are sort of like uh, revealed texts channeled directly from the divine intelligence. Uh, whether, whether you believe that or not is, is irrelevant. Uh, but, you know, y y yogis uh, tend, tend to believe that's the case. And so the, the Taittiriya Upanishad comes from uh, 1000 B.C., a very ancient Upanishad. And in this text, it talks about the Guru Kula, which is essentially the predecessor of the ashram. And so the Guru Kula was this school, like a yoga school, uh, typically far removed from populated areas, so in the uh, countryside or in the forest or up in the mountains. These gurukulas uh, existed, and these were essentially schools. Um, we can think of them as sort of uh, yoga prep schools, <laughs> and so uh, people would send their their youngsters there if they were part of a certain caste or what have you 
to uh, to learn from a guru. That's why it's called Guru Kula. It's like uh, Guru School. Yeah. And this later became what we now refer to as an ashram. But this was essentially a place, uh, again, out in the, in the countryside, far, away, far removed from the cities and populated areas and whatnot, where groups of students would live and practice yoga and meditation and all these things and study the scriptures and all that and learn directly from a wise master or guru. And there were essentially two paths laid out in this Upanishad. One was the monastic renunciate path. The other was the householder path. Neither was held to be uh, superior or inferior. They're just two different paths. So essentially, once a student graduated from the Gurukula, they had to make a decision. Did they want to go out into the world and get married and have kids and get a job and have that typical householder life? Or did they want to remain secluded in a cloistered environment and serve their guru uh, for the rest of their their life? And so those were the two paths, the renunciate path or the monastic path and the household, householder path. And so we can see that that is a very ancient uh, tradition, those two, two paths. And that's nothing, nothing new, in other words. A lot of uh, folks on the, in the Kriya Yoga path, um, for some reason, are under the impression that Lahiri Mahashai was one of the first uh, householder yogis. <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. Of course, this is a 3,000-year-old uh, tradition, the householder yogi. Okay? And... In the Taittiriya Upanishad, we find this cosmology of the five koshas, pancha kosha, pancha just means five, five koshas, pancha kosha. And the koshas are essentially sheaths or coverings that cover our soul or atman. Okay? And so each kosha is we can think of the koshas as, as like Russian dolls. You know, you take one off, there's another layer underneath, another layer underneath until you get to the, to the core. And yoga can be thought of as a process by which we transcend each kosha one at a time until uh, we reach our eternal core. The soul, the Atman. And uh, each kosha has some type of vibratory reality. In other words, it's um, changing and changeable and impermanent, like all of manifest reality or maya. The only thing, I put that in quotes, uh, that does not vibrate or have any kind of form is the Atman, the soul, which is just pure, infinite consciousness. Of course, consciousness has no form, has no vibratory reality. But the rest of our being does have some type of form or vibratory reality in that it is changeable, it's always changing, moving, fluctuating, and it is impermanent. So we can say that uh, none of the five koshas that make up our, our being have any type of fixed reality. Okay. The first kosha is called ana maya kosha. Ana means food. Okay, and so we can think of this kosha as the food covering or the physical body. You are what you eat, no? The food that we eat con uh, converts into our, our body, transforms into our physical form, does it not? And so the anamaya kosha is, is the physical body. 
what we typically think of as the, the physical body. And this is sort of the densest layer of our being. We can also think of the koshas as layers. Okay. And uh, the next one is called prana maya kosha. And this is what we typically think of as the astral body, the energetic layer of our being. This includes emotions as well, energies and emotions, basically. And, of course, the astral body is composed of prana and the chakras and the nadis and all of that. The next kosha is called mano, maya kosha. Manas means mind. And so this is the mental layer of our being or the mental sheath. So this is, this is the mind. This is essentially where thoughts occur. Okay. And uh, this includes the, the subconscious mind, the conscious mind, memories, thoughts, desires, and uh, I, I include the intellect also as part of the, the mind. The next layer or kosha is called Vignana Maya Kosha. Uh, sometimes this is translated as the intellect. Uh, however, others have translated it as the ego. And is sort of synonymous with the ahamkara or the, the, the ego in, in uh, yoga philosophy. And, and I, pr I prefer this uh, translation. And so this is our identity our individuality, our personality, our ego. We can put all those under one umbrella, which is the Vignana Maya Kosha. And then finally, we have the Ananda Maya Kosha. Ananda means bliss or spiritual ecstasy. And so this is the layer that is uh, essentially ecstasy, bliss, the bliss body, the bliss layer. Okay. And, and, and it's always there, by the way. You know, you, you, people think that um, somehow meditation produces bliss. But actually all meditation does is it calms the vrittis or fluctuations of all the other layers so that we can just experience that deeper layer that's always there underlying the rest. Uh, just as we have access to our physical body, our mind, our emotions, our energies, and our ego, personality, and all that, we also have access to ecstasy because it's part of our being. It's just a layer of our being. It's always there, lurking underneath. So, in other words, ecstasy is not something we produce. It's just, I mean, we, we don't produce our body. We don't produce our mind, you know. Um, it's just something that, that's there. It's just part of us. And so it's, it's always accessible. The, the, the problem is that uh, we typically have too, too many vrittis occurring and we, we, we become identified with uh, those more dense layers of our being, like the emotions, like the, the body, thoughts and all that. And so we, we typically don't experience spiritual ecstasy because uh, we're so distracted by all of the other vrittis or movements that are occurring in the denser layers of our being. And then we reach the eternal core, our true nature, the Atman or the soul, which is just pure infinite uh, consciousness. And so we can think of yoga as the process by which uh, we transcend each kosha or layer of our being one at a time until we experience our true nature at the core of our being, which does not move, which does not change, which does not fluctuate, which is always what it is. It's always still, calm, tranquil, serene. That's, that's our true nature. And, oh, around 2000, 
2009, 2010, something like that. I had an interesting insight <clears throat> into uh, the relationship between the eight limbs of yoga, of Patanjali Ashtanga Yoga, that we find in the Yoga Sutras, and the five koshas. And I thought it was a very interesting uh, relationship, and, and so that's why I decided to write a, a book about it. Now, this uh, relationship between the five koshas and, and the eight limbs of Patanjali is, is, uh, is my own sort of uh, revelation, as it were. It, it, you won't find it in, 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 the, in the yoga texts. And so I have received some emails over the years from some uh, Indian uh, scholar, scholarly types, pundits and whatnot, and they, they tell me there is no relationship between the, <laughs> the five koshas and the eight limbs and that I invented it and all this. Well, that's okay. Uh, for, for, I for, freely admit that, you know. Um, so, so as far as I know, and, and probably I'm, I'm not the first person to, to notice this interesting relationship between the eight limbs of yoga and the five koshas, but I was certainly the first person to, to write a book about it. Uh, many people have, have told me that they greatly benefited uh, from that book and from from the idea that the koshas and, and the eight limbs are somehow connected or related and that it helped them tremendously with their uh, sadhana, their spiritual practices, and, and also just with their philosophical sort of understanding of, of yoga philosophy. It certainly helped me. Uh, grasp yoga philosophy in, in, a, in a new uh, way, in a very useful, practical way. We practice different steps of yoga in an attempt to calm or balance the vrittis or fluctuations or distractions occurring at each layer or level of our being, one at a time. And so we start with asana, and we practice asana. We practice the physical postures, the physical practice to relax the body. So we stretch the muscles, we relax, we relax the body, and we, we calm the vrittis at the physical level, the physical layer of our being. And so, in other words, we, we use asana. Asanas to transcend the Anamaya Kosha and to, to calm the vrittis at the, the physical level. And once that has been accomplished, we move on to the next step, which is Pranayama. And we use Pranayama to calm the vrittis occurring at the level of the Pranamaya Kosha, or the energetic body, or the astral body. And, of course, uh, anyone who has practiced uh, a lot of pranayama knows that afterwards you energetically and emotionally are, are very calm and tranquil and balanced. And so we, we use pranayama, these different breathing techniques, to balance and calm uh, energies and, and emotions and all that. So once that's accomplished, we move on to uh, the next step, although I combined uh, two steps for the monomaya kosha, or the mind, the uh, uh, pratyahara and dharana together. And so pratyahara is essentially the internalization of our attention and awareness, and uh, sometimes also translated as the retirement of the senses, and so we essentially... Uh, internalize the sense organs and we internalize our attention and awareness and then we practice dharana which is concentration typically associated with a technique a specific technique that we use to concentrate such as mantra there, there are many techniques that one can use and then once the mind is calm and the vrittis of the mind have settled uh, we practice the next step, which is jhana or meditation, superconscious meditation. And so, superconscious meditation is simply a thought-free, tranquil uh, state. 
where we experience ourselves as being superior to uh, the mind, the body, all these impermanent changing uh, things. It's a very calm, objective, tranquil, thought-free uh, state where we begin to experience our, our true nature as consciousness. And finally, um, and by the way, we, 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 we practice jhana or meditation to transcend the vignana maya kosha, which is the ego, this small sense of, of self, the ahamkara, the, the individuality and all that. And so meditation allows us to, to transcend that layer. And then finally we have Ananda Maya Kosha. And someone just asked me, and I've been asked this several times, um, a student just asked me a couple days ago, why would I want to transcend spiritual ecstasy? Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very deep question, but you have to understand that there, there, there's something else to be to 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 experience beyond ecstasy, beyond bliss, um, and samadhi. And so samadhi is the the final step in the uh, yoga process, or the steps that that potentially lays out in the yoga sutras. Uh, it's difficult to explain, but um, and of course spiritual ecstasy is, is is wonderful. It feels very good and and all that. And, but but a lot of yogis stop there, you know. Um, Mr. Davis, uh, one time was walking with Yogananda at his, uh, desert retreat center in, in California. And, um, and, and he, a he asked Yogananda a question. He said, how many of the, of the, uh, yogis that you write about in your book, Autobiography of Yogi, how many of them are, are liberated? And uh, Yogananda said, oh, not many. He said, most yogis are content uh, with the bliss, to experience the bliss of God communion, and they don't go beyond that. But you must go all the way in your current incarnation. You can do it. I might not have that quote exactly right, but it was something like, it was something like that. Most yogis are content to experience the bliss of God communion, and they never go beyond that but you must go all the way in your current incarnation. You can do it. And uh, it's certainly true that uh, a lot of yogis are, are uh, what my, one of my other meditation yoga teachers, Graham Fowler, used to call them bliss netties. <laughs> it's the only time I ever heard that term. I, I tried to Google it. I couldn't, I couldn't find it. But I, apparently that was a term that they used uh, within the TM group, the Maharishi Mashyogi Graham Fowler was a, was a, a, a disciple of the Maharishi Mashyogi. And he practiced TM and taught TM for a time and all that. Transcendental meditation. And um, I guess they referred to them as, as bliss netties or something like that. And that that's somebody that get becomes addicted to bliss. And they're just kind of blissed out all the time. I've, I've met yogis like that. I was certainly like that for several years. And uh, especially when I was doing a lot of kirtan doing a lot of chanting, stuff like that, and bhakti yoga and all that. Uh, I spent a lot of time really blissed out, just blissed out of my brain. It occasionally still happens. And that's okay. I mean, this, this is not a bad thing, by the way. It's, you know, <laughs> spiritual ecstasy is pretty great, you know. And uh, so, so, you know, this, this isn't something to be avoided, of course. It's okay to, to experience spiritual ecstasy or bliss. As a matter of fact, this is we can use this as an incentive. It sort of incentivizes our, our practice in a way. Because once we've experienced something like that, it impels us to continue with our spiritual practices. However, it can become addictive, and it can become an obstacle. And so we don't want to get addicted to bliss. And we don't want to stop there. You see, here's the thing. If I am experiencing bliss or ecstasy, there, there, there's still some subject-object occurring there at some level, isn't there? I, the subject, am experiencing bliss, the object, you see. 
And, and so there, there, there's still some sense of separation there. However, in samadhi, there, there, there's no separation. There is no subject and object in samadhi. In nirvitarka samadhi, in true samadhi, there, there, there's no subject and object. There's no distance. There's no separation. There's no duality. There's only a oneness uh, that's really beyond description. P- people always say that, you know, oh, it's ineffable. You can't describe It's true. You can't. Every, every time, you know, one of these masters attempts to describe uh, their experience of nirvitarka, they, they, they fall short. It, it truly is an, an ineffable experience. The mind cannot grasp union or oneness because the mind works with twos. It, it works with duality. And so, so it, it, it truly is beyond the mind's ability to comprehend uh, oneness. How, how can there not be separation? How can there be no subject and object and all that? Uh, but, but of course, that is the, the, the goal of our, our meditation practice is, is this experience of yoga or samadhi or union or oneness. And uh, in this experience, there, there are, there's no subject and object. There's no separation. There's no I that is experiencing something else. However, I will say, in <laughs> the experience of Nervi Tarka Samadhi, there's a lot of ecstasy going on, you know. But we're not in any way identified with it. There's no, <laughs> there's no experience that, you know, I, Chris, am experiencing, you know, bliss or anything like that. Because, well, for one thing, there's no thoughts occurring uh, in Nervi Tarka Samadhi. And also, there, there's no subject and object. There's no, there's no Chris there. Chris isn't part of that experience, you see. He has absolutely nothing to do with, with, with that experience. And so, at any rate, uh, that, that's the basic uh, premise or thesis of, of, of my book, is that there is this interesting connection or relationship between the, the eight limbs of Patanjali and the five koshas, and that actually we do use um, the steps laid out by Patanjali to calm the vrittis at every level or layer of our being uh, so that we can experience uh, stillness, peace, tranquility, and then eventually uh, samadhi, union. Okay? And, and so there, there's an order to, to, to the steps, you see. It's very difficult to concentrate, dharana, if, if your attention is wandering, or if your attention is drawn to externals. That's why you have to practice pratyahara before you practice dharana. Likewise, um, it's, it's very hard to internalize the attention and awareness if there's a lot of emotional stuff going on, (laughs) you see. So that's why we practice pranayama before we practice pratyahara. It's also very difficult to calm calm the energies and the emotions if there's a lot of physical discomfort, physical pain, tension, stress in the body, which is why we practice asana before we practice any of any of the other uh, practices you see so there's, there's a scientific process there's a, a very clear logical order in, in in the steps sometimes people ask me uh, can I practice dharana and then do some asana and then practice some pratyahara and then maybe some pranayama afterwards and then try to no 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 you cannot <laughs> sorry now of course any of these practices can be practiced in an isolated manner at any time, I mean, you can practice asana whenever you want. You don't necessarily have to practice the rest of the steps afterwards. Likewise, you can practice pranayama at any time, and you don't have to practice the rest of the steps afterwards and, and all that. Yeah, of course. But Patanjali was no fool. He, he, he put those steps in a very specific order with a very specific uh, logic behind it. And, and so we, we, we can see that they do correspond, in fact, to the, to the five koshas. 
seamlessly, really, you know, so, and, and I'll repeat again. So we practice asana first to calm the vrittis of, of the physical body. Then we move on. We practice pranayama to calm the vrittis of the energetic uh, body, the astral body. And then we practice pratyahara and dharana to calm the vrittis of the mind, the mental level. Then we move on to jhana to uh, transcend uh, this individuality, this identity, this personality, this ego self. And uh, ultimately, eventually, um, by God's grace, uh, we can experience uh, samadhi. Now, of course, there are very le- various levels or stages of, of super consciousness and, and samadhi. And I, I uh, go into to great detail in another one of my books, The Yoga Path, which is a uh, commentary of the first chapter of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, where he, where he discusses all the different uh, stages of superconsciousness and samadhi. And so I, I've gone into great detail in that, in that other book about those various stages and whatnot. But we're, we're not going to get into the weeds here in this, in this episode. So essentially, um, we, we can use this information, we can use this wisdom, we can use this knowledge to assist us in our spiritual path, to assist us in our spiritual journey. And we can understand that, you know, why am I practicing all these things? Why am I doing asana first, and then pranayama, and then pratyahara, and then dharana, and then jhana? You know, why in this sequence? Why in this specific order? Well, now you know. Now you know. That's why. It's a scientific process of moving through the koshas, moving through the sheaths or layers of your being until you experience your uh, divine, eternal nature. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Western Yoga Podcast. Lots of love. Namaste. Namaste.